May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. Jesus said, if someone slaps you, turn and show the other cheek. Is such a teaching relevant today? See, Jesus might have said that too, is the twelve people who are who are around him. That's not a general teaching. To his apostles, people who carry his message, he's telling them, if somebody slaps you one side, show them the other cheek. He's not telling that to the whole world. That man, is the way he lived, he's not the kind to show another cheek. He comes into the temple and throws out all the business. So he didn't say, okay, you got one, one shop here, keep another shop there. Did he say that? Physically, with bare hands, he's destroying their business, isn't it? He is not the kind of man who will show his other cheek to everybody. He is telling his apostles, if you want to carry my message, you must be like this. No resistance in you, no matter what people do, you don't deviate from your path, you just stick to your path, that's all he is telling you. Because these cultures are very dialectical, everything is said with an example or a, a kind of, you know, uh, an analogy. He is saying that, if somebody slaps you on one cheek, show them the other, don't deviate. If somebody slaps you on one cheek, if you try to slap him on the other cheek, on his cheek, then you're deviating from your path of peace and love, isn't it? So he's saying, do not deviate from your path, just stick to your path, no matter what somebody does. All he's say, telling you is, do not become a reaction in your life. If you, want to if you want to act in your life, you should not react. If you react, you'll get enslaved to somebody else, you'll go behind those people. So he's just telling you, do not react. That's his way of saying it. So that's not to be taken literally. His life demonstrates he didn't take it literally, isn't it? In the all-new series, The Truth About Jesus on Sadhguru Exclusive, find out more about the intriguing birth, life and teachings of this wonderful being. Get a yogic perspective on whether Jesus was really born to a virgin and Sadhguru's insights about the teachings of Jesus. Is such a thing possible? It could have been initiated by these three people. If you do not create genetic distance, the old cycles of patterns will take effect whether you like it or you don't like it. This is the most beautiful story about him, that he was an immensely joyful and loving human being. So Jesus versus yoga. No, no, he is my party, I don't see him as anything. In United States of America, there is a segment of people who believe that next time when Jesus comes, he will come in United States. Generally, it's believed he will come in Mount Olive in Jerusalem, but now US people are saying, why will he go to Israel, that's not a good place to go. He will come in United States. So they asked me a question like this in a large gathering, Sadhguru, what do you think, Jesus will come in United States or in Jerusalem? I said, see, last time he came in Jerusalem and he said, come follow me, only twelve people. Hmm? Today you are celebrating him as a great being, but only twelve people followed him. In that one of them freaked on him. All right? But if he comes to United States today, if he says, come follow me, you have a bank loan, student loan, car loan, house loan, holiday home loan, you are mortgage for forty-five years. <laughs> if Jesus says, come follow me, nobody will be there because everybody has to go to the bank. So you have entangled yourself in such a way even if the most significant things happen, you can't change the direction of your life. Hello? If the greatest things came your way, you cannot change the direction of your life, this is a slave's life, isn't it? What is slavery? He cannot choose. That is slavery, isn't it? Now, you are making that kind of arrangements in your life, you cannot choose, you're stuck in your own arrangements. A spider whips a web for other things to be caught. 
But if you are that kind of a spider, you build a web in which you are caught, you are a stupid spider, isn't it? And most human beings are in that condition. <laughs> if something significant happens here, you are going this way, if something really significant happened this way, you can go this way. Your arrangements will not trap you. This is an intelligent life. If you are smart enough, you will make arrangements that support you, not arrangements that entangle you, isn't it? One who is next to you right now is your neighbor. Another cosmos. Well, that's really easy. If you have to just one lump, one being, it costs life. Neighbor does not mean somebody who lives next door. Whoever is… whatever is right next to you right now, one who is next to you right now is your neighbor. If Jesus had said, love somebody who is in the other side of the planet, they would have loved them. Moving easy. Your neighbor, he is not good, <laughs> isn't it? This moment, whoever is next to you, if you learn to love him, you will become loving by your own nature, isn't it? Yes, at this moment this person is there, another moment another person is there, next moment an insect is there, next moment somebody is there. If you just learn to love anything that is next to you right now, your nature will become loving. Loving means what? On the level of the emotion, a certain level of inclusiveness, isn't it? Love your neighbor is not easy, it needs transformation, isn't it? Something about you has to change to love your neighbor. To love God, you don't have to change anything. You can bullshit yourself completely. You can bullshit the whole world and still love God. This is just like these days, it's become more fad. Everywhere, especially I find the new age spirituality in the West, has taken on this, oh, I love humanity, I love the cosmos. Oh, well, that's really easy, you don't have to love anybody. If you have to love one individual, well, it costs life. If you have to just one love one being, it costs life, isn't it? I love the whole cosmos, but I can't stand the person who is sitting next to me right now, that's a different thing. This is just bullshit, <laughs> too much of it. Yes? I love the whole humanity. Where did you see the whole damn humanity to love them? No, I just love. Yes, that's very easy. Just try to love one person and see what it costs. So much of you, you have to put it on the ground. So much of you, you have to surrender if you have to love just one person, isn't it? Yes? yes. But I love the whole humanity. <laughs> this is easy. Someone said, love the neighbor. That's very significant, very significant. Oh, let me check who is my neighbor. That's not the point. Whoever is next to you right now, whatever is in touch with you right now, just love it indiscriminately. The very air that you breathe, neighbor? Yes? Is it your neighbor? Yes. The water that you drink, neighbor? Sitting here, right? Hmm? Is he your neighbor? Yes. The land that you walk on, is he your neighbor? Just to know that whatever is in touch with you right now. Now, this is something else, it costs life, otherwise it won't. Happen. Jesus is not a good man. Maybe he's wonderful, but not a good man. If you don't let that man rise within you, then you will remain good and dead. That part of you which has been kept dead for too long, it's time to raise it.
whatever we are referring to as Jesus is not about some man two thousand years ago, it's about a certain possibility within every human being. So that has to rise. It's not that there is no Jesus in you, it's just you kept him hung, impotent. He needs little empowerment, he needs to be raised. So the whole effort is that part of you which we can call Jesus or Shiva or whatever you like, to allow that to rise. Can you say Shiva is a good man? No, but he's fantastic. Even Jesus, not a good man, wonderful, not a good man. Anybody who disturbs the existing situation is not a good man, isn't it? Yes or no? In any given situation, someone who disturbs your family situation, somebody who disturbs your social situation or political situation, national or international situation, is not a good man in that society, isn't it so? So Jesus is not a good man. Maybe he's wonderful but not a good man. Shiva definitely not a good man, but fantastic he is. If you don't let, let that man rise within you, if you do not let that aspect rise within you, then you will remain good and dead. Dead is good, dead is always good. Yes or no? Once it happened, a five-year-old boy and his mother went to the cemetery. He had never seen a cemetery in his life, this is the first time. The mother was dedicated to one particular grave, she sat down. The boy went about everywhere, reading all the inscriptions on the tombstones. He went through the whole cemetery, read everything and came back to his mother and asked his mother, Mom, where do they bury all the horrible people? <laughs> Every tombstone says this was the most wonderful man. Dead is always good, isn't it? Dead is good, living is trouble. <laughs> because living is trouble, we reduced the living to half dead. Fifty percent life is safe, that's where most people have settled. We must decide, dead or alive, half dead is not good, isn't it? Once Shankaran Pillai was arrested for mixing horse meat in chicken cutlets and selling. So when he went uh, to the court, there was nothing else to do, so he pleaded guilty. And they asked, how much horse meat and chicken meat, how did you do? He said, fifty-fifty I did. So he got some fine and some kind of thing and then he came out. His friend asked him, what did you mean by saying fifty-fifty? He said, one horse, one chicken <laughs> That's fifty-fifty <laughs> So this mixture won't work, you have to raise the dead, you really have to raise the dead, that part of you which has been kept dead for too long, it's time to raise it. What is life? This is after sixty. You should have asked this question when you were eight, at least when you're sixteen. <laughs> sixty. But what to do, better late than never <laughs> he asked. Then yogi <coughs> laughed and went into raptures. Oh, life… life is like the fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze. <laughs> the bishop looked at him and said, what? Life is like fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze. Our teacher told us, life is like a thorn. Once it gets into you, 
If it… if you sit, it hurts, if you stand, it hurts, if you lie down, it hurts. What is this fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze, spring breeze? So the yogi smiled and said, well, that's his life. So this comes from the fundamental that when a human being clearly, experientially understands that entire experience of human life is created from within, never from outside. Right now as you sit here, do you at least see me? Even if you're not listening to me, I'm saying. <laughs> Can you use your hand and show where I am? Ah, no, no, you're getting it all wrong. You know, I'm a mystic from South India <laughs> Now this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina, you know the whole story. Where do you see me right now? Within yourself. Where do you hear me right now? Within yourself. Where have you seen the entire world? Within yourself. Have you ever experienced anything outside of yourself? Right now, someone next to you, if they touch you, you think you're experiencing their hand. No. You are only experiencing the sensations in your hand. In the very nature of things, you cannot experience anything outside of yourself. When everything, when the entire experience of life is caused from within you, at least it must happen the way you want it, isn't it? Hmm? The world will not happen the way you want it. At least <laughs> the experience of living here within you must happen the way you want it. If… if… if your experience of life happened just the way you want it, how would you keep yourself, blissful or miserable? Please, you must tell me I'm going to bless you <laughs> Blissful or miserable? Blissful. For yourself, definitely highest level of pleasantness for yourself. What you want for your neighbor may be debatable, <laughs> but you know what you want for yourself, isn't it? Now blissfulness or pleasantness of life is not a goal by itself. It is only when you're blissful by your own nature. That means you determine the nature of your experience. No matter what is the situation, you determine the nature of your experience. Or in other words, you have no fear of suffering. Only and only when there is no fear of suffering, will you walk full stride in this life. Otherwise, it's always about what will happen to me, what will happen to me. Every step is a half a step. Now, this so-called spirit of Eastern wisdom comes from those beings who walked full stride, who determined the nature of their experience. The outside never decided who they are. So, they could walk full stride and explore the depths and dimensions of life that others never dare to touch because most of the humanity is only concerned about what will happen to me. What will happen to me means what? Will I suffer? That's a question. The first and foremost thing, if you truly want to explore dimensions which we are referring to as another dimension of wisdom or knowing is that first you must determine the nature of your experience. You have no fear of suffering. Only then, truly exploring human consciousness becomes a reality. Touching dimensions of intelligence which gives access to the entire universe becomes a possibility. I'm supposed to open up for questions. <laughs> it's time you ask your questions, please. The population I work with that are in the verge of homelessness or they're addicts. If I tell them that it is your intellect and it's your perception and this doesn't exist, they will laugh at me because it definitely they exists. Must, because yeah. it's the dumbest thing to say. Right. So I wanted to know the spirituality that you teach, the spirituality that many gurus teach, how is it usable for someone that doesn't have food to eat? 
and it's going to become homeless. And there's so many problems, especially in America. I mean, how do, of course I teach them resiliency. It's a different fact. But to, every time I want to open my mouth and use some of your teachings, I have to set back. Now, the first uh, problem is uh, that you believe in the teachings because this is the problem with the entire world. They have been cultured in some belief or the other. This is what is significant about what is referred to as Sanatana Dharma or what is referred to as the Indian way of looking at things is, this is not a land of belief systems, this is a land of seekers. Never ever were anybody encouraged to believe anything. If you see anything that comes from that land, you will see it is all about questions, <laughs> never about a belief system. If you enter an Indian home, in the same house, five different people are worshipping twenty-five different gods and goddesses. <laughs> they still not made up their minds, which is… <laughs> I think a sabbatical <laughs> is good <laughs> He may come up with something that you've not thought possible. <laughs> I will… I will convey your message, Jai <laughs> Sadhguru. I'm sure he's watching this program <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru, I believe that talent is something which is grossly exaggerated in success. It's… when I was in medical school, I used to teach martial art. Uh, that was my passion <laughs> and uh, every time a Bruce Lee's movie was released, all these school kids would come and join in hordes to martial arts schools. We used to call it Bruce Lee They're phenomenon. after two weeks. <laughs> yes. And I used to see some kids whose physique is meant for martial art, who have the natural flair and I used to think, oh, this kid is going to get a black belt. And interestingly, Swamiji, mm -hmm. after six months, they're never there. The guys who go up to the black belt and, you know, do something very good in martial art are the ones who join the school without any skills, without any talent, who worked very, very hard for everything they had to sweat it out, but in the end, they are the ones who succeed. How do you explain this phenomenon? <clears throat> See, uh, for a variety of reasons, let me not go beyond this, for a variety of reasons, a certain individual could be born with a certain flair, physical flair, mental flair, emotional flair, style. You know, five-year-old child, one has style, other is clumsy, okay? <laughs> So the one with the style is not going to become necessarily a fashion thing. Somebody else who seems to be clumsy may grow into something else. Like uh, you don't know when a woman is pregnant, the child within that womb, whether it's a sage or a sorcerer, not the woman know. No, the mother does not know whether she is producing a sage or a sorcerer or what. This is because I use the word coherence because of modern science is using that word. Who you are here right now, as you sit here, this is physics. Every subatomic particle is in constant contact with everything. What you call as cosmos is living life and it's a live mind. You have captured only one small part of it. If you work with only that one smart, small part of what you have captured, both as life and as intelligence, you will function at a certain level. If you apply yourself to break the barriers of your limitations that you've set for yourself, then there is an intelligence beyond anybody's understanding, beyond anybody's estimate which is available to you. Once this is available to you, People think you're superhuman. No, this is not about being superhuman. 
This is about realizing that being human is super. The immensity of being human has not been realized. So we are always making a, a kind of a mathematical calculation. Okay, if this person has this much IQ, maybe this is what he will become. This is what Newton's law, that everything that moves on this planet works to your mathematical precision or a geometric precision. That is, if you take a pendulum, the length of the pendulum will decide how it will swing. If you take a projectile, depending upon its mass, velocity and uh, the, pr the trajectory, it will go to a certain place. That is not how the cosmos is working, because what you think is physical and not physical is all mixed up within this, within this human being. The physical self, the psychological self, the emotional self and who you call as myself, the life within you, the fundamental life process, these are all different dimensions. And the innermost core of who you are, which… because all the other words are corrupted, I'll use the word life or just you, what you call as me. This, if you allow it, if you do not identify it with any form, with your physical form or with other different identities that you take on, it has a, a way of being cohesive or collaborative with everything around. When we say somebody worked hard, all he is trying to do is stretch his boundary of identity, isn't it? He's trying to stretch his boundary. If he succeeds to set, stretch his boundary, something that was… he never thought possible or imagined that is within his competence or capability becomes his. Miraculously, I can show you hundreds of people who come to me, we prepare them for a certain period and then we initiate them in twenty-four hours you will see the shape of their face will change. Genetics are altered in twenty-four hours' time. You can see the photographic images, they have actually changed dramatically overnight simply because of a certain extension of their identity. So, in the Indian spiritual milieu, so when you say spiritual, we must understand this. This is not about looking up or looking down. When we say spiritual, we are talking about transcending the limitations of physical. So right now, the physical is here as if it's a solid entity in people's experience. But modern physics is telling you and medical science is beginning to telling, tell you, or if people don't understand, if they just hold their nose for two minutes, they understand that they are not an independent existence. It is in transaction, not just in terms of breath. Even on the level of subatomic particles, it's in constant transaction. If this transaction becomes even minutely conscious, suddenly you have immense capabilities that you never thought were possible. Biological identity is the most limiting identity that you have because it limits to the area of your body. Now when you strive, you break this. It doesn't matter in what way you strive. Most people strive in unconscious, unscientific, simply out of striving, they do things. But there are ways to strive scientifically in a proper way. There are tools to strive with specific direction to break the limitations of who we are. If you break this boundary, the subatomic particles are transacting, the intelligence is transacting, only you're missing the whole game. If you don't miss the game, if you are in the game of life, not in the game of thoughts and emotions, you are in the game of life, suddenly just about anything you want you can do, not this or that. I'm saying anything can a human being can do, simply if he breaks his barriers. And these barriers are many levels, but the most fundamental thing is the identity. And it has tremendous memory. If I open this water, or even without opening, if I say something to this water, it remembers. There has been lot of experiments in this direction. So, uh, if you take this water, from wherever the waterworks is and pump it to your house. Let's say it went through fifty bends, forced… pumped forcefully with a certain force, which naturally is done. And you are living on twelfth floor of the apartment, so further forced up. Now they are saying, if it goes through fifty bends, about sixty percent of the water has turned poisonous. Immediately when it comes in the tap, if you take it and immediately drink it, it will work as poison in your system. If you take it and hold it for some time, it will undo itself again. Because the poisoning is not chemical, 
it is molecular. Molecular changes are happening, no chemical change is happening. This is why traditionally your grandmother always told you, always you must gather the water, keep it overnight in your house, in a properly cleaned vessel with vibhuti and kunkum on it and one flower on it. Yes or no? In traditional homes, only tomorrow morning you drink it. Not as soon as it comes inside your house, you don't drink it because it carries all kinds of memories. In very traditional homes, people every day do puja to the water pot. Yes? And you never drink the water as soon as it comes. You keep it, give it enough time to undo itself from whatever nonsense it has gathered so that it is suitable for you when you drink it. Water you must take care because it's seventy-two percent. It's more, it's first class, you know, more than passing mark. Next thing is food because that's the earth, twelve percent. One more thing if you want to do, you just light an organic oil lamp, a cotton wick, some oil, anything. What do you use here? Normal cooking oil. Linseed oil, rice bran oil or sesame oil, what do you have? Olive oil. Olive oil, fine. Any organic oil with a cotton wick, just burn one little lamp somewhere in the room where you sleep. You will see these things will completely disappear. If you can bring in a chant or there are nightly practices, yogic practices, before you go to bed, sit on your bed and do this practice. Do you know, in about… if you live for about sixty years, you're… on an average most human beings are eating anywhere between eleven hundred to fourteen hundred tons of food. So that means even what you think is my body is not this, it's changing every day. New input is happening and old things are going away. So fourteen hundred tons, you don't have to carry that much of weight right now. So obviously, what you have as a body right now is just a transient amount of food and soil, isn't it? Hello? So what you think is mine also is not it, it is just all the time changing. Tonight before you go to bed, spend at least twelve, fifteen minutes reminding yourself, you're neither this body nor this mind. Just lie down and just remind yourself, this body is not really you. It is mine right now for use, but it's not really me. Just if you're not able to do it, just link it to your breath. Inhalation, I am not the body. Exhalation, I am not even the mind. Just lie down for twelve minutes and do it. Till the last moment, till you fall asleep. This is something you must notice. I've spoken in the prisons, I've spoken in many places <laughs> So you're here willingly. You're doing something willingly is the fundamental of your joy, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. However simple or stupid or idiotic activity it is, I am doing something willingly, makes a world of difference, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. The difference between heaven and hell is just this, you are doing something willingly, that's your heaven. You are doing something unwillingly, that's your hell. Hmm? We have already taken on attitudes, what we like and what we don't like. I like this person, I don't like this person. Now with this person I will do things willingly, with this person I'll do things un unwillingly. This may be two people, two aspects of life, two communities, two nations, two many things. This I will do willingly, this I do unwillingly. This means I've decided in my mind this is good, this is bad. When I hear even an national news channels, good guys and bad guys, it just… once you have this kind of thing, you are going to be disastrous to the planet, it's just a question of time. The moment you decide this is a good person, this is a bad person, this has gone deep into American society, no, there are no good people and bad people. Everybody is oscillating between the two. If you create a very pleasant, wonderful atmosphere, everybody behaves wonderfully. If you create an unpleasant atmosphere, a whole lot of people act nasty. Mm -hmm. This is how the world is. 
If you think what you're doing is very significant, you learn to work with all kinds of people. You will see horrible people will do wonderful things. Yes? Yes, yes. But if you want to work with ideal people, you won't find any. I haven't found one yet. <laughs> all kinds of mixed bags. Yes. But <laughs> if you are willing, that you are not yes and no, yes to one, no to another, you are simply one big yes, you will find a way. <laughs> Thank you so much. That… I… I… I always say that it's the resistance <laughs> life. Many problems that human beings are suffering is simply because we have lost that awareness as to how to be in sync with the many forces. If you become in rhythm with life, you will also wake up somewhere after 3 a.m. At that time, if you sit up and do whatever process you have been initiated for, it will bear maximum fruit. In the way the planet is spinning and what is happening, something very fundamental changes somewhere between 320 to 340. This is called Brahma Mahurtam. This is relevant only up to 33 degrees latitude. Your system, human system, functions in a certain way. It is a possibility. So, uh, there has been an awareness about making use of this possibility. Your life is a product of many things that we call as the universe, many things that we call as existence. So we are a consequence of a certain phenomenal happening that we call as cosmos. We are not an individual existence. So when you get in sync, certain things will happen. You know, there's a <coughs> cicadias in uh, where we are in Tennessee, the U.S. ashram, they wake up once in seventeen years. Can you beat it? They know it is seventeen years and they come awake and they breathe and they go back to sleep. They're keeping time once in seventeen years, no alarm bell anywhere. Well, how is this? I'm saying they're in sync with nature. We have lost sync within nature and we think that is our nature. No. All the many ailments, many problems that human beings are suffering is simply because we have lost that awareness as to how to be in sync with the many forces which are making us who we are. So yoga is to bring that sync so that you are in rhythm with life. If you become in rhythm with life, you will also wake up somewhere just after 3 a.m. If you're conscious, suddenly a certain spark of aliveness will happen within you. Even if you're in deep sleep, you will come awake. This must happen to you. This means you're falling in sync with it. You're falling in sync with life. So what should I do? Should I meditate? Should I do a Kriya? doesn't matter what, you must do a process for which you have been initiated for. Because initiation means you were not just taught a practice, it was introduced into your system, it was implanted in your system. So whatever, if there is a life seed within you, if you are awake at Brahma Mahartam and sit for whatever that practice is, it bears maximum fruit because of the way the planet is behaving in relation to your system. If you become aware in a certain way, a certain level of awareness is achieved within you, you will see, you will simply know when the time is. If you go to bed at the right time, 
you don't have to look at your watch. You will always know when it is 3.40 because the body will behave in a different way. At that time, if you sit up and do whatever process you have been initiated for, not what you picked up from a book, it will bear maximum fruit. The seed will get the necessary support at that time for it to sprout or spurt up more rapidly than, you, uh, than at other times. This is only for the initiated. If you are not initiated, you are a book yogi, then 3.40, 6.40, 7.40, not so much of a difference. Sandhya colors are more important for such people. Sandhya means twenty minutes before sunrise, twenty minutes after sunrise or twenty minutes before sunset and twenty minutes after sunset. The same goes for noon and midnight but they are of a different nature. So these two twilights are better for the uninitiated. 3.40 is good for those who have been powerfully initiated. Visionary Women is a volunteer-run uh, organization and I know that every single person who is here is giving their time to one organization or another. And the fact that you have nine million volunteers and you were talking about the relationship between volunteerism and willingness and that it's through willingness that you uplift your consciousness, if I'm quoting you correctly or I'm understanding it. In some ways, talking about how it could be a doorway to becoming a bigger person than mm -hmm. who you are. See, uh, before we come to women, first thing is visionary. What a vision, a vision means is, see everybody has desires. Desire is an incre incremental way of enhancing our life. Today you desire, I must have a home, tomorrow you desire, I must have this money, tomorrow you desire something else. These are incremental ways of arranging and rearranging our lives, mm -hmm. which are needed to do a few things. When you say, I'm a visionary, what you are saying is, I have a larger desire, which is not about just incremental improvement of my life. Desire is about me always. Vision is an all-inclusive all process. So, this itself is a phenomenal thing. If people, instead of having desires, if they have a vision, mm -hmm. vision is always all-inclusive. Desire is personal. Desire leads to incremental changes and improvements. Vision can transform the whole situation. I like music <laughs> So, uh, about willingness, because you said you're a volunteer organist, to be a volunteer, a volunteer means somebody who is doing something willingly, right? There's no other compulsion. There are no financial compulsions, there are no social compulsions, there is no something else. You want to do something willingly. So when you're a willing participant right now, you're a volunteer. I'm asking all of you, right now, are you compelled to be here or are you here voluntarily? Oh, thank you <laughs> Because I've spoken to conscripted people also.